why should the South Africans who are facing these brutal, brutal situations and being persecuted by their own government not also be allowed their safety? Whites are now living in poverty in greater numbers, with an estimated 400,000 of them living in squatter camps. It's not politically correct to talk about the genocide of white people by a black majority government, but that's what's going on in South Africa. There is a horrific and purposeful genocide going on against white South Africans. Queensland Liberal Andrew Lamming says he's been worried by reports white farmers were victims of state-sponsored persecution. By mercenaries who have potentially been trained by the state. 47 farmers in South Africa uh, get killed by ANC-connected communists. This is government-sanctioned murder. Yeah. Uh, they are now targeted for murder, targeted for extinction. It is a policy of racism and genocide. And even and people will say, oh, that's a conspiracy, that's a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy. What's most important now is getting information like this out about what's happening to this persecuted minority that is constantly being threatened with genocide by the majority of their countrymen as well as by their very own government. There will be no white farmers left in South Africa within three years. Some say they don't have that long. The whites are being systematically cleansed from the land. So, South Africa. If you're an average person living in the West, you probably don't know or quite frankly think that much about South Africa. And that's most likely because the media doesn't really care about anything that's happening outside of your country. But if you've been paying attention to the far right, you've probably heard a lot about it. And that's because South Africa has been a talking point of the far right for decades. But with the recent rise of the alt-light and alt-right, we've seen a resurgence in these far-right narratives. Now there's a very good reason why the far-right covers these topics, and a lot of other people don't. And that's because things are complicated. South Africa has a long and very complex history, and as I previously stated, not many people in the West know anything about it. And as we'll see later in the video, there isn't a lot of solid, clear-cut data for a lot of the problems that are facing South Africa. And this creates the perfect environment for the far right to spread misinformation that helps their wider narrative. Now we're going to look into those larger narratives and how South Africa plays into them in another video. But first, I think we all need to get caught up. And that's going to involve us learning some history. Whoa, 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 wait. Come 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 back. Come come back. Don't worry. I already learned all the boring history stuff by myself. So we're going to do this in a more entertaining way. The original reason why I was going to do this video was because of Lauren Southern. She's been talking about South Africa a lot, with an upcoming documentary where she focuses on poor whites in South Africa. And given the fact that she has a history of citing open racists as her source... You know, I can't be racist, I'm just quoting statistics. Oh, by the way, my first source is a fucking Nazi. Saying she thinks that anecdotes should count as evidence? Her no, no, I'm gummy saying, bears. I'm saying I think we should know what is going on on the ground. Sure, but the way Data that- Data is the plural of anecdote. I think we need to no, know what is- No, it's not. No, it's not. It's absolutely not. It's absolutely not. Data is not the plural of anecdote. Data is a carefully constructed and collected thing. And pretending that Paris's culture has been utterly destroyed because she walked around the neighborhood and didn't see French braids anywhere. I thought it would be a pretty easy and fun video to debunk. But then I found this, and it's a video where she's addressing why she's only focusing on white people in South Africa. And basically what she says is that the mainstream media is biased because they only cover black South Africans and not news about white South Africans. And because of this bias, she's going to create her own video that is also biased because it only focuses on white people and ignores black South Africans. Lauren, why are you only focusing on white people in this country? 
Why are you focusing on white murders, white struggle, all of this? Is it some sort of like, everyone in South Africa faces issues. The crime rates, they affect all the people. So why am I talking about white people? Well, there are two different reasons that I'm doing it. And the first one is the international coverage and what they decide to talk about. Entire families massacred, crucified, raped, and they're lucky if it makes the local freaking paper here. But I'm focusing specifically on this one story because the other media refuse to report on it. It is politically incorrect to report on it. It is just taboo to talk about. So based on that, as far as I'm concerned, she just admitted that she's purposefully creating a biased documentary. And that combined with the fact that white South Africans are still far richer than black South Africans, and that the numbers of people that are in these shanty towns are vastly overstated. And from everything that we can see from her trailers, it seems like it's all just anecdotal interviews. I figured that it would actually be too easy to debunk that video. In fact, I just did it already. It's her whole documentary's debunk. So that brings us to this video by Stefan Molyneux, because it's actually one of the most comprehensive videos that I found on the topic. Stefan and Simon Roche, more on him later, basically cover the entire history of South Africa, and they manage to hit just about every single far-right talking point when it comes to South Africa. So this video was an utter buffet of bullshit. In fact, I'm not even going to be able to address everything that they either lie about or just muddy the waters on. So before we go any further, let's talk about Simon really quickly. This video is one of many that he appeared in during his US tour back in 2017. During this tour, he seemed to focus mainly on speaking with people from the alt-right. And that's because the reason for his tour was to raise funding for the organization that he works with, Swedelanders. Their mission is to gather resources and manpower to deal with what they claim is an impending white genocide in South Africa. But once you dig past all the fake and skewed statistics, you'll find out that this is all based on the prophecies of a man called Nicholas von Rentsner, who was a Calvinist boar who made a bunch of vague prophecies back during World War I. And in these prophecies, he predicted black people taking over South Africa, and then there being a war of atrocities between them and the whites, where a small number of whites eventually took control, issuing in a new paradise. He says the Afrikaners will rise again and regain their freedom. The nation will take their destiny into their own hands. There will be a great silence before the storm. I see a pail full of blood toppling, falling. And from the pail will rise the fear clear flag to fly again over a free nation. So like I said, in this video they briefly covered the history of Africa. But we're going to skip forward a little bit, so let me catch you up to speed. Unfortunately, a lot of the time when we look at African history, we tend to do it through the lens of when white people showed up. And because of the topics we're covering, we're going to be doing that in this case. So the TLDR is that in 1852, the very first Dutch settlers landed on the Cape of South Africa. And after that, French and German settlers also showed up. These people would go on to form the core of the Boer people, later known as Afrikaners. It's important to distinguish the difference between them and the English who later showed up, because those two groups never got along. And eventually, these groups of people started to push further and further into the interior of South Africa. 125 years down the line, here comes a commander of this, the fort at the Cape of Good Hope, Cape Town, and he wanted to engage in the slave trade, but there were no broad-shouldered, black-skinned people to be exploited. He wanted to get his hands on slaves, and it took him two years to find the first black-skinned people between Cape Town and the slave trading ports uh, on the upper east coast of Africa. He found them uh, on the Great Fish River of South Africa. So that means that around about 45%, perhaps a little bit more, of South Africa had never been uh, occupied by the black people of the time. So this is one of the first big narratives to pop up. And we see that both Simon and Stefan make sure to push on this point multiple times. So at that point in time, 1838 was when there was first big contact, big conflict uh, between the Boers who'd gone into the hinterland and the black tribes who were beyond the Great Fish River in that sort of 50%, 55% of South Africa that was indeed occupied, although by this time, as recorded extensively by particularly the London Missionary Society in journal after journal and report after report, the, the hinterland was utterly depopulated. So, so we have, I mean, for almost 200 years, we have Boer expansion into generally unoccupied 
territory. I mean, it's like setting up your farms on the Antarctic. I mean, you know, you may maybe displace a few penguins, but you're not really impacting human settlements. But uh, let's remember, of course, largely unpopulated land. And what they're talking about here is the myth that much of the land in South Africa was unoccupied before white settlers arrived. And I say that it's a myth because there's no anthropological evidence supporting it, and we have evidence contradicting it. This myth dates back to before 1866, and it was originally created by Europeans to justify their move into these lands. Fast forward to the beginnings of apartheid and we'll also see that it was the underpinnings of the Natives Land Act. This act created 10 homelands, which black Africans were then forcibly moved into. And of course, while making these homelands, whites made sure that they got to keep the best farmland. Ultimately, this meant that 70% of the population was crammed into only 13% of the land. We'll talk a little bit more about the homelands later in the video. So the Boer myth claims that the Bantu people moved southward into the area of the Fish River around the same time that the Boers moved northward from Cape Town during the Great Trek. But archaeological evidence shows that the Bantu people existed in the area as early as 300 CE with a second migration in the 12th century. That was 400 years before the Boers showed up in the 17th century. And in those 400 years, they intermixed with the Khoisan people who already existed there for over a millennia before the Boers showed up. The British now having annexed South Africa, succeeding eventually in beating these 45,000 militiamen, um, <clears throat> conducted a census as good colonials do. And they recorded a black population at the time of just about 2 million Souls. In 1950, they famously did a census of their own, again, to assess for themselves what resources they were taking over in the country. And the black population was then 5 million. The white population was just about 2 million. But the population of blacks under um, white, I wouldn't say rule, but under white authority has been steadily increasing. And that is not what people often think about when they think of, you know, the decimation of colonial powers and destroying the local population, driving them off cliffs and into the ocean and into graves. No, well, between um, 1950 and the year 2000, the black population, as we said, went from 2 million to 5 million, now it goes from 5 million to 40 million, an eightfold increase in two generations. It's a phenomenon. And these are the things that make us so frustrated, these egregious facts and figures that the world overlooks, and we believe it's deliberate, because how can such phenomena not be acknowledged? Okay, so this is another weird argument that's brought up multiple times. It's weird for two reasons. The first is that it's all around a bad argument. The fact that the black population grew in this time period says nothing to the living conditions that they were in, or to how they lived as second-class citizens when compared to whites. For example, the black population grew in America under slavery, even after it was made illegal to import new slaves, and the black population continued to grow even more under Jim Crow. But that doesn't mean that their quality of life was good or that they had freedoms. And the second reason why this is a weird argument is because of Stefan Molyneux's politics. Considering this is a man who thinks that taxes are oppressive, he seems very quick to excuse the abhorrent conditions that black Africans lived under. Are you against the horrors of the permanent underclass that has been created by government education and the welfare state? Does your conscience say that this is monstrous and evil and it's the most destructive thing that has ever been foisted on the poor outside of the medieval goddamn plague. If you're a cow in an electrified paddock and you want to spray paint on your side, I don't like me paddocks, farmer doesn't care. Just stay in the goddamn fence and you can do whatever you want. The fence is your money. The fence is your obedience, which is enforced upon you. So when your friends say to you, I want so-and-so to be in power, I want so-and-so to be in power, I'm in favor of the war, I'm in social security, national debts, you name it. What they are saying to you, to your face, is... If you act upon your conscience and cease to support that which is morally repugnant to you and destructive to the lives, literally, of millions of people, if you act on that which is right, I want you kidnapped and thrown in jail for years. You are ringed by the snipers of statism and those who support you being thrown in jail for following your conscience. That is the stakes that we're at. You're ringed by weapons. And you say to people, put down the weapons. Let's reason about this. Put down the weapons. Let's reason about how to solve problems in society, how to about fix things, how to get things done so that people don't get caged, so that the unborn don't get sold off and stolen from, so that the solution to problems is not always more guns, more laws, more fucking cages. Let's just reason together and see if we can't find a way to have a society which is not murder-based, which is not cage-based, which is not violence-based.
This is something that is often underappreciated in this sort of general demonizing of Europeans, de demonizing of Christianity, demonizing of whites. Uh, it has swung too far. Of course, criticisms can be leveled upon all occupying powers, all governments at all times. The question is, where would you rather live? But the population of blacks under um, white, I wouldn't say rule, but under white authority has been steadily increasing. And that is not what people often think about when they think of, you know, the decimation of colonial powers and destroying the local population, driving them off cliffs and into the ocean and into graves. Just because they had a lot of kids doesn't mean that they weren't poorly treated. You know, this, this is another thing that people sort of need to understand a little bit about South Africa and, and poverty as a whole, that, you know, if, if generally, if, you know, white people or East Asian people get a lot of resources, they end up, you know, focusing on careers and learning how to play the flute and <laughs> learning how to do kabuki theater with um, skiing gloves and stuff. But what happens with um, other populations, if you give them a lot of resources or there's more money or food around, they just have a whole lot more kids. And that, of course, is the big challenge when it comes to trying to solve the problem of poverty. There's an old saying that the best contraception is industrialization. That's not true for all populations true. around the world. It's not true. It's, it's you know, it goes to our case, uh, selection theory. And the simple reality is that some people re will react to it in a certain way and other people will react to it in a different way. Okay, so this argument goes by really quick and most people wouldn't even think that much of it. But both Simon and Stefan know who they're messaging towards and the alt-right is all about this. And that's because these are alt-right race realist memes, specifically the RK selection theory. So the point here is to imply that black people will inherently invest a small amount of resources in many children rather than invest a large amount of resources in a few number of children, like whites. And when they have resources, they'll squander them. The other thing that they like to ignore is that RK selection theory doesn't apply to different races of humans. In scientific terms, it applies to different species, their reproductive organs, and how their offspring develop after birth. Now there are some people in the race realist community who try to argue that black people are actually a different species. Um, so arguably, you know, we could arguably be considered different species. This is not to mention the amount of separate evolution that we've gone through individually um, away from them and uh, but we are definitely by any standard of the imagination different subspecies you know I think that's perfectly reasonable um, I've tried coaxing this out of a few different scientists and they they tend to just kind of you know silently give a nod of the head without actually saying it because it's so unpolitically correct that you just can't say look there are different subspecies here um, but I thought it was particularly funny. There's this guy on Twitter I'm following, he's a Chinese guy. And every now and again, he tweets, Chinese women, do not, do not mate with other species. <laughs> it ruins integrity of Chinese species. <laughs> you know, so. And there are others who have abandoned this on a biological sense and have instead created the idea of psychological RK selection theory, which doesn't have any evidence behind it and ignores that for humans, environmental factors have bigger consequences than biological differences. So let's take a look at the environmental differences between black and white South Africans. So between 1950 and 1986, 1 1.5 million black Africans were forcibly relocated to the 10 homelands, which we already discussed. Once there, they were not allowed to freely move. They could only leave a homeland if given permission. They also had to carry passports at all times and were regularly beaten by police if found outside of the homelands. The passes have been enforced in South Africa for a very long time amongst the main. And it has become very clear that the pass system in South Africa is the basis of forced and cheap labor. Now to impose such a system on the African women is to create hardships. African women will have to produce these passes on demand. If they fail to do so, they will be arrested in the streets, they will be stopped at stations, they will be stopped as they visit one another in the locations, and if they haven't got those passes, they will be stopped and immediately arrested and brought before the court. Because of a lack of resources and government neglect, these homelands turned into slums. The new apartheid state relied on black labor. Under this system, black Africans were only allowed to do menial labor, and the education system was even molded around this. As we can see in this quote from Hendrik Vervoort, who was South Africa's Minister of Native Affairs, and was later their Prime Minister. There is no place for the Bantu in the European community above the level of certain forms of labor. What is the use of teaching the Bantu child mathematics when it cannot use it in practice? That is quite absurd. Education must train people in accordance with opportunities in their life, according to the sphere in which they live. 
He then went on to help pass the Bantu Education Act of 1953. This act ensured that whites would always get better access to education than black people. Black schools only received a fifth of what white schools were given. This is because he thought that black children should only be educated to the level that they could be wood haulers and water drawers. This is one of the roots that still haunts South Africa to this very day. Remember, we're not even a generation removed from the end of apartheid, so large portions of the black population stepped into freedom with very little education, which is one of the reasons why we still see such a big income gap. And as we can see in other countries, poorer people tend to have more children. And as they become wealthier, they have fewer children. This is currently happening in South Africa as more and more black people move into the middle class. So this argument holds no water, and it also ignores science and the history of South Africa. Well, if any of the um, liberal viewers of your channel ever make a pilgrimage to Nelson Mandela's house in Soweto, they'll pass the world's largest hospital on the left-hand side on Old Potch Road. It's called Chris Harney Baragwanath Hospital. The, world, the largest hospital in the world was built in the middle of Soweto. That is what permits people or assists them, if they don't rein themselves in, to produce phenomenal population expand, expansion, such as, with all due respect to your viewers, Europeans and Americans don't comprehend. They, they just have no frame of reference to appreciate this, I don't know, explosion. So let's pause for a second and take a deeper look into this hospital that Simon's talking about. Like a lot of the things that they talk about in this video, it seems like a very small, innocuous point. But once you dig deeper, you find out a lot of very interesting things. For instance, the fact that this hospital has been a large part of Afrikaner nationalist propaganda since apartheid. Originally it started as a military hospital, but under apartheid it found itself within the Soweto Township, which was a segregated area, which was formed when blacks were forcibly removed from Johannesburg. And then it became a civilian hospital for the black residents. The apartheid government used the hospital as a showpiece. Originally they talked a lot about its size, similar to Simon. It's the world's largest hospital. And of course, because it was in a homeland, it suffered funding like everything else. For example, in 1988, 101 doctors from that hospital signed an open letter calling the conditions disgusting and despicable. This was because the apartheid government was only spending $22 per black patient and the hospital had served 2 million people compared to the $100 that was spent per person in Johannesburg General, which only served 500,000 whites. It turns out that they didn't even have enough money for beds. And despite its massive size, it was overcrowded and people were sleeping on floors. So it seems pretty dishonest to act like having a big hospital and access to healthcare was good for black people, when it turns out that the hospital was overcrowded and they were getting worse care than white people, despite being a majority in the country. And it was done in the spirit of a sort of Christian conservatism. You know, unlike, um, and, and this is not to say that we're entirely benevolent and everybody else is bad, but the simple reality is that that kind of benevolence where you build the world's biggest hospital for people that you're oppressing didn't occur in Mozambique, Angola, and in Congo, Zaire, under the Belgians, but it was very much a product of the, the hard, tough, poor Afrikaner people. Yes, apartheid, yes, this, yes, that, yes, the other. But there was always a kind of thing in the background of, we will be judged if we don't do a bare minimum for, for the people. If we're too cruel and too hard, we're going to get punished for it. You know, this Christian ethic is, is a core, core, core characteristic of the people. So, okay, tell me, we better build hospitals and schools and what have you that didn't happen in other colonial environments with the results that we've discussed. In this video, both Simon and Stefan work overtime to pull out these apartheid apologetics. We'll see later in the video that they try and push the blame for apartheid onto the English. They also completely ignore focusing on any of the negatives of apartheid while only playing up the supposed benefits of it, which at the most were scraps thrown to the black population so that the white population could prosper. None of these things were being done out of altruism. They were simply doing the bare minimum to maintain a pool of cheap labor. It's, it's very important to clarify one thing. Apartheid was begun by the British after the, their success in the anglo Boer War in 1902. It was the British who said, all right, these Afrikaners have been here for a while. They're living in more or less peace with the blacks. Yes, they're dominant. Nobody's suggesting that the Afrikaner Boers were not dominant. Uh, but there, there is not conflict. There is an absence of conflict. And the two parties are occupying more or less the same land, the same territory, the same sovereign states. The one is, in, is, is uh, recognized citizens. The others are second class citizens. But the fact remains, they're OK. The British then devised various uh, techniques and strategies which later became known as apartheid well in advance of apartheid, up to 50 years before, and there are extensive records of this. Even if the English did start apartheid, that's still pretty irrelevant considering apartheid took place 
under the Afrikaner rule. But when you actually do look into it, like Simon suggests, you turn out that he's not being entirely accurate. Now, the English definitely did set up restrictive measures, which were a prelude to apartheid. But one of the most significant and drastic things that led up to apartheid, which was the Native Lands Act of 1913, happened under an Afrikaner parliament. And this was after South Africa was established as a country at the end of the Second Boer War in 1910. So the Afrikaners had control of the parliament for three years before they passed this act. But once again, when you look at this argument, it doesn't even stand on its face. And when you go deeper, it turns out that it's not even supported by facts. I mean, this is clearly being done to try and absolve the Boer people of any responsibility for apartheid. Um, and in the intervening period, South Africa was an extraordinarily successful country. Wealthy, middle class, not, not egregiously wealthy, not, not stinking rich. But everybody lived a comfortable life. Of course, there was a tier of second class citizens in the form of the, the black African people and the colored people. Think about what he just said for a second. Not everyone was rich. There was a comfortable middle class. Of course, there were some second class citizens. But everyone lived comfortably. That is, unless you were 70% of the population who were living in militarized slums. Fuck you, Simon. And this has nothing to do with uh, uh, any particular preference for any race or ethnicity. My particular concern is as much for the blacks in South Africa as it is for any other group. Because if the general idea that population swells because higher IQ groups are in charge, and then if those higher IQ groups are displaced, then what happens is the conditions that have allowed for the creation of the um, larger population, if those begin to fall apart, then you face the death of millions of people, you know, through starvation, through war, through disease, through infant mortality. You create a, a, a you set the stage for a staggering, amount of suffering. And so the idea that, well, you know, we've just got rid of apartheid and now everything's going to be sunshine, roses and, and magic ponies is extraordinarily dangerous because there is a large population right now in South Africa uh, and in other places, of course. And if the conditions can't be continued to, to be met that allow for the continuance of that high population, let alone its increase, well, what, what's going to happen? So this is an interesting argument because I don't know what Stefan would have actually wanted because as we've already seen, the apartheid government worked to keep black people undereducated. Many well-educated whites left South Africa taking their capital with them. So of course South Africa is struggling. It's suffering the ripple effects of apartheid to this very day. You would think that someone like Stefan, who's so preoccupied with the tyranny of government, would value freedoms more highly. He's essentially saying that it was okay that black people were oppressed because they were able to have a better life than other Africans. I mean, he's also generalizing the IQ of all the black people living in South Africa. He doesn't show any evidence that low IQ black people are moving into governmental positions. It's just as likely that black people with comparable IQs to white people are moving into government. These arguments reek of the white man's burden, which is the idea that white people have a burden to help dumber, inferior races who otherwise couldn't help themselves and apartheid, and I'm not entirely sure that the causes uh, of apartheid, the productivity of apartheid, regardless of how we look at this morally, economically, it was enormously productive. So that was a really quick assertion, which they never actually backed up. And it turns out that it isn't even true. The apartheid economy wasn't that particularly strong. In fact, that was one of the reasons why they moved away from it. Despite the fact that unemployment is up, the economy has grown significantly since the end of apartheid and wages have increased. I'm not sure that there was a very clear sense of how things were going to work other than magic pixie dust of egalitarianism and democracy is going to make everything even better than it was before. Was there anything else in place that I wasn't aware of that, that was going to aid in this transition? No, no, not at all, Stefan. You know, that, that the, the whites handing over power go, uh, is very much to do with this conservative Christian ethic thing. Uh, it was easy, relatively easy, to persuade people to do this unprecedented thing. I mean, almost unprecedented in history, where a group of people says, oh, all right then, you know, we feel so guilty, we're so bad, we're such nasty people, go on, you can have it. Of course, there were many people who said this is going to end badly. But by and large, people didn't want to be responsible for being the bad guy. What they had done, what was necessary, built this terrific society, this exceptional society, and then started to think, well, maybe, you know, we've been a bit too nasty. So it was quite easy to twist people's um, perspective, you know, from inside apartheid to outside in, in, in a moment. Now, the argument that it was some type of Christian white guilt that led to the end of apartheid is 
pretty ridiculous because there were a number of factors, from outside international sanctions against South Africa to the fall of communism, which relieved a lot of fears, and also the increase of clashes and riots that killed hundreds of people, which sprung up around the assassination of anti-apartheid activists. All of these things were contributing factors. To say that it was just because of white guilt is patently absurd. And let's talk a little bit about the crime. The crime is for those who, you know, maybe if you live in inner cities in America or other places, it's somewhat comprehensible. But for most of us, the level of crime, the, the fear of being outside your own home, the fear sometimes of being inside your own home, the need for sort of barbed wire and, and safe rooms and, and weaponry and so on. Let's have a look. It just, just gives us a walk us through the, the, the numbers of murders under apartheid versus the number of murders occurring every year in South Africa at the moment. I think that the best reference point um, that I can give is that South Africa was known for the fact that nobody had garden walls during apartheid. Uh, and that's indicative of just how safe it was to live in South Africa. Now, everything has changed quite drastically. So this is a pretty weird anecdotal argument that he's making about walls around people's houses, which I don't even know how to verify. But even assuming that it is true, the reason why people didn't have walls around their homes before is pretty clear. It's because the walls were built around all of the poor people. And as we know, crime is correlated with poverty. So if you have all the poor people stuck in concentration camps and only let them out under strict military watch, of course the white rich population isn't going to have to have walls. Now, everything has changed quite drastically. The number of murders of whites by black people since the beginning of apartheid is around about 74,000. Nobody is certain. The best extrapolations and records uh, show something like 74,000. The danger multiple is 0 0.44, meaning that as a three-year-old three South African little girl, white girl, or as a 90-year-old granny, you stand just about half the chance of being murdered as you would have if you'd fought as a soldier in the Vietnam War. Okay, so now we're getting into the really dangerous memes. The first thing to note is that crime statistics in South Africa are very poorly kept. So nobody has a really clear picture of the crime rates for anything in South Africa. Neither Simon's numbers or my numbers are based on solid data. Everything that I was able to find was working with the best numbers available, but none of them are exact. And crime absolutely is an issue in South Africa. It's hard to find any solid numbers for crimes like theft and rape, for example. But we do know that those rates, along with the murder rate, are higher than those in Western countries. But the interesting thing is that murder rates have been on a steady decline since the end of apartheid. So despite the crime rate being very high, it's significantly lower than it was under the apartheid system. In fact, we can see that at the end of apartheid in 1994, there were an average of 74 murders a day. That has dropped to 49 per day in 2015, despite a population growth of about 40%. And the whole narrative that whites are disproportionately in danger isn't supported by the data. In fact, whites are much less likely to be murdered than black people are. This is supported by an analysis that was done in 2009 of over 1,300 murder dockets. This analysis found that over 80% of those cases, the victims were Africans, Whites only accounted for 1.8% of the cases, despite being over 8% of the population. Now you have to keep in mind that that data is very old, but it's the most recent data that exists. There are no numbers to back up Simon's claims. In fact, one of the big problems when it comes to the statistics on the farm attacks is that the race of the victims aren't kept. So despite there being a 23% increase of farm attacks in 2016 to 2017, we don't know the race of those victims. And I don't even know where he gets that 74,000 number from. It seems like he might have gotten it from this South African singer? And she doesn't cite any sources. In fact, every time that I found this number, nobody can back it up and in a few instances when they've been challenged, they have re-advised their numbers. And that's because, like I said, there's no statistics backing this stuff up. Well, and the sentiment, this is even as of 2002, 60% of South Africans said that life was better under apartheid, which it only ended 
eight years earlier. And then, you know, this is when it's to me, it's sort of like a trajectory, like when a society is going up and a decision is made that fundamentally undermines the forward or upward progress of that society, there's momentum. You know, the, the, the um, infrastructure doesn't fall apart all at once and the economy doesn't collapse all at once. It slowly goes out of focus, you know, like eyesight in your 50s or something like it slowly goes out of focus. And so even just eight years after the end, people, 60% of people said that it was better under apartheid. Okay, now this one was a real rabbit hole. Mostly because none of the claims that anybody makes in this video are supported by citations anywhere. By the way, if you want to do any further reading, I've left links in the description to everything that I've talked about, citing all of my sources. Because I actually care about facts. So this 60% number that Stefan quotes most likely comes from this Guardian article. But it turns out that when you actually dig into the survey that they reference, you won't find that figure anywhere. The two questions that you will find are, government under apartheid, where a majority, 57.8, rated apartheid under a 4, on a scale where worse was a 0 and the best was a 10. There is also a question, current system with the last two political parties, where a majority, 62%, rated the current government at a 5 or higher. When asked, is your life today better, about the same, or worse than it was under apartheid, 48.1% said that it was better or much better, and only 29.7% said that it was worse or much worse. And data as recent as 2016 supports this, although the favorability numbers are slightly lower. So Stefan's 60% claim is completely wrong. And here's, here's an example, another f f statistic that people really need to digest. More people are murdered in one week under African rule than died under detention of the Africana government over the course of 40 years. More people are murdered in one week than who died in detention under the Africana government over 40 years. God bless you for, for saying it, Stefan, because the people don't know this. And I mean it very sincerely. You, you are doing something you, with all due respect, I doubt appreciate fully what you're doing by exposing these, these truths. Okay, so once again, this just isn't a statistic. He's probably reading this straight out of an article on the National Review, but the problem is that they don't cite any data, and that's because they're just quoting something that a woman named Alana Mercer has said. Who's Alana Mercer, you might ask? Well, she regularly writes for Jared Taylor's American Renaissance, with articles that have quotes such as this. Let not the swirl of statistics conceal the flesh and blood causalities of this black on white offensive. South Africa's farmers undeniably are the focus of ethnocide. Contrary to the Syrians and Somalis streaming into the United States, they would make fabulous refugees, President Trump. And this. An aging white population is speeding up diversity, blared a headline in The Hill. The reverse is likely true. Corrected, the Hill headline should have read, Could speeding up diversity contribute to a decline in the white population? The now waning West became great not because it was more populated than the rest of the world and outbred it. The West was great because of its human capital, innovation, exploration, science, philosophy, because of superior ideas and the willingness to defend such a civilization. And she's also the author of Into the Cannibal's Pot, Lessons for America from Post-Apartheid South Africa. Gee, that sounds like a fucking unbiased source. And even if these numbers did exist, who cares? Because ultimately he's comparing two totally different things. One is a murder rate of the entire population, and the other is a murder rate of people detained by a government who are under their oversight. But I guess if we had to take all of that into account, we wouldn't be able to push the narrative that blacks are inherently a bunch of violent savages. Now would we? So let's take a, a quick detour to something that is not reported on much in the West, which is these um, the farm murders. And here we're going to bring in the term which many experts have brought into. It's not just a term that we have been bending back and forth, but this question of uh, genocide. And um, according to the Human Rights Organization, Genocide Watch South Africa is at a pre-genocide stage, six of eight, which is preparation. Um, and uh, eight, of course, is, is extermination. So you never want to be anywhere on that continuum, but you sure as hell don't want to be closer to eight than you are to one. So a small amount of credit to Stefan here. He doesn't actually cite Genocide Watch as saying that there's currently a white genocide in South Africa. As many Africana nationalists, open racists, and Simon himself has said. But he and Simon are still overstating the significance of this Genocide Watch rating. The first thing to keep in mind is that just because it's at a 6 now, doesn't mean that it's going to progress. Nobody can predict the future. 
We don't know how things are going to go. And we don't know what's going to have to happen to move that number up or down. Another thing to keep in mind is that other organizations that track genocides and the risks of genocides don't have South Africa at a significant risk or even at a risk at all. There are also issues with the data that Genocide Watch uses and the fact that they aren't transparent with their methods. Farming in South Africa is the most dangerous occupation on the planet. There are more murders per capita for farmers in South Africa than on any other community in the entire planet that isn't currently in a war zone. It is more dangerous to be a white farmer, as you just said, than it is to be a policeman in Guatemala. Now, when we speak about farmers, we speak about the family, not the, the, the male alone in these statistics. So that means that you've got more chance of dying as a four-year-old daughter in a farmstead in South Africa than you have if you're a policeman in Guatemala. Once again, comparing the likelihood of white people being murdered in South Africa to police officers being killed in Guatemala is ludicrous because there just isn't any solid data supporting that. And when it comes to farm attacks specifically, the most recent numbers that we have come from a 2003 inquiry which found that 38.4% of farm attack victims were white. Which granted, these numbers are incredibly old and they can't be applied to current trends. But like I pointed out, that's the most recent data. Simon has nothing. Granted, the attacks that do happen are absolutely a problem, and in some cases are extremely brutal. But when we actually look at the numbers, it turns out that none of this is supported by data. And these, are, these are clearly hate crimes because if it was merely they want your wallet, they want your cell phone, they want whatever it is you've got, then this uh, torture and, and rape and mutilation uh, and so on, which we talked about occurring hundreds of years ago uh, in, in South Africa, would be entirely unnecessary. That These are ideological crimes, these are hate crimes, these are race war provoking crimes uh, that are predicated largely on, uh, again, socialist fuel, lefty fuel, resentment of farmers who were doing better just as the communists did in Russia when they went to all the poor farmers and said, oh, those farmers are only rich because they've stolen everything from you. And then they took the land from the more productive farmers and gave it to the less productive farmers and everyone starved damn well to death. These are crimes of ideology. They are not crimes of poverty. So once again, this is an assumption. There isn't any recent data on this. The latest numbers that we can find are once again from 2003. That inquiry found that the vast majority of attacks had robbery as the main motivation. Once again, these numbers are extremely old and we can't apply numbers from 2003 to 2017. I guess it's up to you to decide if old data or no data is better in this situation. Probably the best thing to do in this situation is not make inferences whatsoever. But you can't scare the shit out of people with that. So... If there is, as has been talked about by a variety of government representatives, a forced nationalization of this land, how does this not become a race war? I can't imagine. I can't imagine knowing what I do about the Afrikaners that a lot of them are just going to say, well, that's fine. Uh, we'll give up our land. We'll go live in the squatter camps along with hundreds of thousands of other whites that have been rendered unemployable by more than 100 segregation race-based laws that have come into effect since the end of apartheid, even more than they were under apartheid. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hundreds of thousands of whites live in squatter camps? Instead of hundreds of thousands, I think what he meant to say was around 31,000. And those numbers are even pretty sketchy. This is only briefly focused on in this video, but this is a pretty big talking point within the far right. In fact, that's mostly Lauren Southerns. The interesting thing is that despite early white flight from South Africa and affirmative action programs, whites are still the wealthiest people in South Africa. In fact, the average white South African earns five times more than the average black South African. You know, everybody who's out there who, who watches this, who, who listens to this, you now have an obligation. This is the great price of knowledge. With knowledge comes responsibility and obligations. If you know how to cure a disease, well, guess what? Now you're the guy who's responsible for curing the disease. So, wow, we're actually going to end this video on a point of agreement. I agree that with knowledge, there does come responsibility. And I hope that I've given you enough information to help debunk this far-right propaganda and to go out and challenge it. That's going to be the end of this video. In the second part, we're going to explore how these narratives work outside of South Africa and where they fit into the larger far-right narrative. Since you've made it to the end of this video, which I want to thank you very much for sticking it out, I think it's safe to say that you found this video useful. If you did, please give it a like and tell me what you thought of it in the comments below. And please consider sharing this either to like-minded people or people who might be challenged by it. And if you really like this video, please consider becoming a patron to help me make future higher quality videos. I want to thank both Three Arrows and Claudia Brown, who are both kind enough to take the time to record voiceovers for this video. And I want to thank the MOA, who provided a lot of help for research on this video. If you don't already follow their channels, please go do so. 
they are fantastic. I also want to thank all of my fantastic patrons who are currently scrolling up the screen right now. I also want to give a very special thank you to Ewan Wardle, Polar Robin, Liam Waddy, Jenny Messer, Zoe Tropes, Google Hushabye Valley or I'll give you a swirly, Sleepy Slug, Adam00, and Miss Contrary. Your support has really helped to improve my videos. I cannot thank you enough.